Welcome to the first installment of The Conquered and the Proud, Roam the World Empire from 200 BC to AD 200. The idea of this course is to look at one of the major chunks of Roman history and give an overview. And it's very much the story of how Rome, the city, became the dominant power in Italy and then expanded to create this world empire. You know, by the standards of the time, by any standards indeed, the Roman Empire at its height covered an enormous area, a large chunk of the world's population, and it lasted for an extraordinarily long time. Now, in this course, we're not going to cover all of Rome's history because that's an even huger topic, nor can I go into immense detail in every aspect of the, the themes from this period, but hopefully I'll give people a taster the idea is to present this not as a university course or that style, even though it's based on things I've taught in the past over the years, but for those who are sufficiently interested to want to think about Rome's history, to learn something about it and give a sense of the connections between events, personalities, um, developments in engineering, in technology, in the economy, all of these things we might know a little bit about. We might know about Roman bathhouses, we might know about gladiators and circuses and chariot races, the Senate, the legions, all of these sorts of things, but trying to suggest a context, to bring these together so that we have more of an idea of what Roman society was like and how it changed. So it is a story of the growth of an empire, and it's the story of how and why the Romans acquired so much territory and came to dominate over such a wide area. And it's then the story of how this changed the Romans, both the Roman state, the Romans as individuals, just what it meant to be a Roman and how different that was at the start of our period compared to at the end. But it's also the story of the impact of all of this on the peoples around them, on the conquered and the proud. You know, this line from Virgil where he talks about Rome's destiny or the Jupiter as parcere subjecti se debilare superbos. The Romans are destined to have power without limit and they're going to spare the conquered and overcome the proud in war. It's a binary division of the world really into either people who are proud, who are arrogant as the Roman would see it, who are hostile, who are unwilling to admit that as far as the Romans are concerned, the obvious superiority of Rome. Therefore, if they're suitably humble, if they're suitably um, submissive, and when the Romans arrive, say, oh, yes, you know, we realize we've got to be friends with you, and yes, what would you like? I'm sure we can help with that and treat you with great respect, then that's fine. You can treat them with mercy, you can be generous, you can be kind, but if they're proud, if they dare to be independent, then you fight them and you defeat them. And you turn them into the humbled, or they cease to exist, at least as a political state. So there are some pretty stark choices when the Romans arrive, and also when they stay, because the Romans intervene in lots of areas and don't necessarily create provinces there. So living under Roman rule could be a, an experience that changes gradually, that you realize only after a matter of time that the Romans are here to stay and that the world is different. And how do you deal with that? Do you resist openly or do you resist in smaller ways? Do you accommodate yourself with the Romans? Do you work out actually that this is a system that can benefit you in a big way? And different people, different individuals, different groups respond in all of these ways. So that's the broader story. It's the story of empire, but told both from the perspective of the imperialists, the Romans, the conquerors, but as far as we can, thinking about the experience of those who are actually becoming part of this empire, some willingly, an awful lot unwillingly. So this is our broader theme, and it's important because the Romans do play such an important role in world history and particularly shaping the culture of the West. So you have as the two great central themes really of Western culture, you have the Judeo-Christian tradition and the Greco-Roman tradition. Many aspects of Greek culture, Greek ideas come to us via the filter of the Romans and the Roman Empire. And a lot of things we consider to be Greek were set down, written down in the form we have them, constructed in the Roman period under the Roman rule. And so many Greeks would become 
prominent members of Roman society in the same way that to be an educated Roman aristocrat from late second century BC onwards, and certainly in the, the period of the late Republic under the Principate, you would be expected to be fluently bilingual in Greek as well as Latin, and to be as familiar with Greek literature as you were with Latin. So there are lots of big themes. It isn't simply a one-way process, and the Romans will take on ideas and technologies, even aspects of costume and style, from the peoples they encounter, from those they, they conquer, they um, absorb into their empire. So this is... History is the story of human beings, and however much society may shape our attitudes, the way perhaps we think about certain things, the way we act, there is so much in common that you, when you have any period of history where personal details, emotions, things like that are recorded, you can always recognize fellow human beings. Now, I must apologize for the moment on behalf of Augustus the Cat, who has climbed up to a very tall cupboard and is deciding to make his presence known by meowing away and yelling, but refuses to come down. So having stopped recording this video three times already and gone back to this point, I think I'll just keep going and hope that he's not too distracting. And perhaps for the cat lovers out there, it might add an interesting sideline to this talk. So all history is understanding how human beings act. And it's, it's a little bit like allowing us to see, well, under these sorts of pressures, this is what people tend to do. And you know, as Thucydides said in the, the late fifth century BC, you can be fairly confident that people will behave in similar ways in the future, if not perhaps going as far as his events repeating themselves in very similar patterns. But nevertheless, there is much in common with the way human beings behave at any time. And that's what make his, makes history valuable. And of course, as I've said, in the Roman case, it is particularly important because of the scale of influence that the Romans have had on subsequent history. They have influenced the West. The West has gone out and spread its ideas, many of its cultural aspects, its legal per um, perceptions around the world. I remember quite a few years ago being asked to tra help translate some Dutch Latin law, which was in use in Zimbabwe, because again, that's the system that they've inherited there. So you have Roman law over most of Europe, not in Britain, where we have the, the Anglo-Saxon tradition that has shaped things differently. You have, of course, throughout the medieval period, the preservation of much of the memory of Roman and Greek literature, along with um, the literature of the church, by the Catholic Church, with a pope in Rome. And yes, obviously there are times when there are disputes and there are other popes elsewhere as well. But nevertheless, Latin is preserved in that way. It helps to shape our way of thinking. It also, the Roman Empire would shape the geography of Europe in terms of particularly the organization of many of the dioceses that were the church preserved, went back to Roman administrative divisions from a period beyond the period we're talking about. But nevertheless, it's there. And the Romans give us so many images of power, of sophistication, and also of decadence and cruelty. So we know about gladiators and the thought that the Romans could go along very happily and watch human beings being slaughtered as a form of entertainment. And they'd watch animals being slaughtered as well. And they would accept slavery as a perfectly natural thing, as did most peoples in the ancient world to one degree or other. So the Romans are not all good and they're not all bad. They are complex, as human beings tend to be. And we can marvel at their achievements in engineering, the sophistication of their system of all weather roads, of the bathhouse, something that is entirely designed to make life more comfortable and yet is one of the most sophisticated pieces of engineering that the Roman Empire produces. We could look at their grand buildings. You know, you've only got to go to the, the Pantheon of Agrippa in Rome today or the Baths of Caracalla and just marvel at the sheer scale of this, the Colosseum, obviously, is a, another point. Again, used for a grim purpose, but it is spectacular in its sheer size. And there are monuments left by the Romans all over the empire, whether it's amphitheaters, temples, basilicas, forts and fortifications, complexes like Hadrian's Wall in the north of Britain. So the Romans left a physical stamp on the landscape that is still visible. Behind me, you've got the photograph there of Mile Castle 39 on Hadrian's Wall. 
Um, there is a lot there. The Romans are constantly in our memory. They are part of popular sense of, of history in that you see somebody dressed up in a toga or dressed up as a Roman legionary and it's recognizable as to what this might be. A political cartoonist can draw a contemporary politician with a laurel wreath and a toga and perhaps with people ready to stab him behind the back and we think of Julius Caesar and we recognize it. We know the illusion, the Ides of March. People are out to get someone who's been successful up until this point. Now, some of that might come from memory of Shakespeare's plays, but those were written because of the power of the Roman stories and those traditions that had reached us. So even if it's indirect, even if it comes by a fiction, by a, via television drama, movies, plays, we remember the Romans and we think about them. So it's worth trying to understand rather better just what the Roman world was like and how it all worked. So let's begin. We'll do an overview of the entire period we're going to cover, obviously um, fairly briefly at the moment, before we then look in more detail at the starting point, what the world is like in 200 BC. Now, the sources for early Roman history are not very good. The Romans themselves did not begin to write history until after their defeat of Hannibal, which is around about the time we start our period. They did keep records before that of laws, of some magistracies, of property and property ownership. Not much has survived, but we know these things were there. There were family traditions, heroic songs, celebrating the deeds of aristocrats and the ancestors of the elite of the day. And archaeologically, we can see what's going on. But most of what's written down comes centuries and centuries later. So a lot of the early history of Rome was set down in the first century BC in the form we have it, by which time how much people actually knew with accuracy about what had gone on is very, very hard to say. And clearly in the earlier stories, miraculous events, myths tend to blur with the um, what seems like more sober traditions of, of perhaps basic, perhaps even occasionally reliable uh, facts and information about what went on. So, of course, famously, you have the story of Romulus and Remus, you know, exposed, raised by a she-wolf, then by a shepherd, and they go to, off to found Rome while they're marking out the city. The two brothers argue. Remus jumps over the, the line of the city walls that his older brother Romulus has marked out, and Romulus kills him with a spade. After that, you have Romulus rallying the vagrants, the outcasts, the outlaws of Italy to form the the population of his new city, or at least the, the male element of it, because they lack women, they then, you have the rape in the, the traditional sense, the literal sense of carrying off of the Sabine women. You know, you invite the Sabines to a festival and while they're distracted, you go and steal all their daughters and you're supposed to make them into wives and that they are supposed to be the peacemakers between the two communities. These are all very dramatic stories. They've inspired plenty of artists over the years. But how much truth there is in any of them is extraordinarily hard to say. One thing that is worth noting is these are very odd traditions to invent at, at first sight. You know, these are not particularly complementary to the Romans, that your early years begin with such a degree of violence, of kidnapping women, um, you know, and fratricide at, at the start. So, and that even the people who found your city are the outcasts. You know, yes, you have a tradition that develops more later on and you see expressed in Virgil's Aeneid, the idea that the ancestors of Romulus and Remus and some of the others are exiles from Troy. So that ties you into the Iliad and the great epic, the Trojan War, the, great, the greatest of all stories within the Greek tradition. But how much of that, how early any of that starts is, is hard to say. Traditionally, they date the foundation of Rome to 753 BC, that's by our calendar, and the Roman calendar is based for a long time on Aberbe Condita, from the foundation of the city. So they're counting on years from that. And then in time, they will come to date each year by the names of the two consuls. So it's the consulship of so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so -and, -so, and then so many years from the foundation of the city. And that's their dating system. But remember as well that like most of the Greeks, most other peoples in the ancient world, 
up until Julius Caesar's reforms, the Romans are following a lunar calendar. And the lunar calendar, whilst it follows the cycle of the moon, is by its nature less precise than a solar calendar because it's, it doesn't quite fit the solar year, which defines the seasons. So you will find when you look at um, sources talking about and historians talking about earlier Roman history and indeed Greek history, where you'll get a date where it's actually spread between two years. Because by our standards, it wasn't one neat year. It's, again, trying to work out where the system was at that time. The Romans used to insert extra months to balance things up, to try and get the thing back in sync with the seasons, and also to manipulate the political um, cycle as well. And these are things we'll come on to later. Now, even though we've no idea whether Romulus or anybody like him actually existed, it does look archaeologically as if it's round about the 8th century BC. So it's round about, it's in the right framework of time that communities come together on the hills of Rome and a, a central community emerges. And it is probably likely that there was a leader or leaders who would make this happen. You know, it, generally speaking, that's how these things develop. Somebody gets everybody moving, inspires them, cajoles them, perhaps forces them, frightens them to do this. But the community is settled there. It's a fairly good site for a city. There, there've been, there's been settlement up on the hills for some time because hills can be safer, they're more defensible. You're near the River Tiber, which is navigable for a long way um, to up to the city. You've got... Um, the, you're on the Via Solaria, the salt roads, so you've got access to that particularly important re resource in a world before refrigeration, where you can at least salt meat and fish and preserve them for longer than would otherwise be the case. And it's there, Rome is there at a natural crossing place of the River Tiber. So it's in a good site and it's significant, but it is just one Latin speaking city amongst broader Latium, lots of other Latin communities and you have nearby the Etruscan cities as well. Etruscans are a, a culture that have left quite a substantial archaeological trace, but in many ways we still don't fully understand, although again, people are, are doing their very best and we know a lot more than we used to, but there are still aspects we don't quite get about how their system worked. Now, Roman tradition was that at first Rome was ruled by kings and the stories were told that there were seven of them, beginning with Romulus and ending with Tarquinius Superbus, Tarquin, Tarquin the Proud, who is forced out of the city, who's backed by the Etruscans, and um, the Rome becomes a republic in 509 BC. A date that probably seems to be about right as well. So there seems to be broad truth in the framework anyway, the background to what the Romans are saying later on about their early history that you do have this community formed in the 8th century, that is Rome. You do have the rule of kings for a considerable time. You have the dominance of aristocratic families at that time as well. You have warfare from the very beginning. They are fighting, but they're fighting wars with neighbours who are very cr close. And yes, there are battles, but there's an awful lot of raiding, of cattle rustling, of threats, reprisals, all of this sort of thing. But they are one Latin city among many. Now, let's see. We will go on to the Republic, and we're going to talk about that in some detail in the second talk, um, about its constitution and how it works and its political system, focusing particularly on the start of our period in 200, but we'll look back a little bit as well. So I won't go into that in too much detail. But the Republic survives, although it has to survive lots of challenges. And again, there is a great danger that we anticipate, that because we know what's going to happen, we think that the Romans are always markedly different from everybody else out there, and markedly stronger and so bound to succeed. But actually, the period soon after the formation of the Republic and the, the 5th century into the 4th centuries BC are particularly troubled times on and off in throughout much of Italy. You have population movements of many of the Moscan speaking peoples who some of them come down from the Apennines from the mountains, some perhaps from further afield, and they overrun many of the communities in the more settled lands. And plenty of them disappear, plenty of Greek colonies, plenty of other Italian and Latin cities do not survive this. Famously, Rome itself is 
captured uh, by the Gauls in the early 4th century BC and they extort a large amount of money to um, to go away. Now again, you have the Roman tradition of them trying to capture the, the capital where the last Romans are holding out and a night attack is given away by the geese of, of Juno from the temple there, cackling away that rouses the guards who are able to fight the Gauls off. But the Roman tradition still preserves the idea that Brennus, which really just means great king, the Gallic leader has to be paid in gold to go away. And of course, there's the story that the Romans think he's cheating them in the way he's weighing on the scales, and he's supposed to have drawn his sword, thrown it onto the, the scales, so the Romans have to pay more with Ve Victis, woe to the defeated, woe to the vanquished. Again, probably romantic invention later on, though you never quite know. The basics are fairly clear. The Romans did fight this group of Gauls who were probably a wandering war band, a mercenary band, rather than necessarily a certainly they're an army that doesn't seem to want to come and settle and conquer and you have to pay them to go away. But that's after Roman military defeat. And strikingly, in the generation that follows, the Romans build very large, extensive, impressive city walls around their community. That's a, a big enterprise. So it does suggest a community that does not feel safe and feels the need for protection they didn't have before. So again, the archaeology sort of broadly fits with the traditions, but we probably shouldn't hammer any details too hard and think that yeah that's definitely what's going on they don't tie together as much as that the the romans survive other communities perish and you get samnites and other oscan speaking groups establish themselves as the new powers in various parts of italy but the romans survive they endure in spite of the, their defeats and they're still there now, they've been fighting wars, as I mentioned before, from very early on. If you look at the earliest traditions about Romulus and others, warfare figures prominently. And you have at the uh, very beginning of the 5th century BC, the Romans start paying their troops. And the tradition is that there is a 10-year siege of the city of Vey, which is, you know, 8 to 10 miles away. All of this stuff is very, very local on the whole. And they fight this long war. Now, 10 years has a very much an echo of the 10-year siege of Troy, so you wonder whether this is an embellishment. But nevertheless, there probably were frequent struggles with communities that um, are close by, relatively speaking, and that you fight generation after generation after generation because the wars are nasty and brutal, but they don't end up in such a decisive result that one group is destroyed. But that tends to change by, particularly in the, it starts in the 5th century, gathers momentum in the 4th century BC, the Romans start, start to fight more wars that they persist in until they've won and the enemy is reduced to a subordinate state or sometimes absorbed. Now we'll talk more about this process as we come on and how it all works and the Roman willingness to extend citizenship to others. But by the 340s BC, the Romans have come to dominate all of Latium. All the surviving Latin-speaking cities have become either, they've been settled by or they've become part of the Roman system, whether directly they've become Roman citizens and they are an extension of Rome, or in more cases, they are allies of Latin status. And Latins have a legal status that is not as good, not as generous as that given to a Roman citizen, but it is still puts you as part of the system. You are obliged to serve with the Romans, or when the Romans form armies, at least half of any army is going to be composed of Latins and other allies. But you gain, you're obliged to do that, but you also gain some of the spoils of victory. And in some cases, there is a sort of ladder where but you can progress and become ultimately a Roman citizen in the long run. So the Romans have absorbed them successfully. Then they move further afield. They um, overrun Campania. Then they deal. There is a very hard-fought series of war against wars against the Samnites. You've had the Etruscans and others. They push out further and further, and they follow the same formula. The Romans tend to persist. If you beat them once, they come back. They seem to have this ability to endure, this sort of dogged determination to keep going. And they insist upon wars ending much more in their favor. They are trying to have a permanent victory, one which either 
destroys the enemy as a political entity, though that's relatively rare, more often they absorb them. They become allies. They become part of your system and they will help you fight the next round of wars when you go off and fight against other enemies further afield. So by the early 3rd century BC, when the Romans are pushing into southern Italy, they are by far the biggest power in the Italian peninsula. And in the 3rd century, they come up against the city of Tarentum, a Greek city in southern Italy, modern Taranto, and the Tarentines, as they've done in the past, hire assistance from it's then King Pyrrhus of Epirus, but they've had Epirot help in the past. He brings over an army that includes a pike phalanx, heavy cavalry, war elephants, all the paraphernalia, all the tactical sophistication that has developed under Philip, particularly Alexander, and then the successors, the generals who fought over the, the spoils of Alexander's empire. And he inflicts two very serious defeats on Roman armies, something that they haven't suffered for a while, with heavy losses until they finally beat him in a third battle. But again, the striking thing is that Romans do not give in. Even when they suffer battlefield defeat, they refuse to negotiate a peace settlement that would allow the Tarentines to show that they are superior and that they've won, but um, leaves the Romans largely intact, a little bit humiliated, less prestigious, which can have knock-on effect for how reliable all your allies consider you to be and whether it's worth their while staying as your allies, into, um, you know, so that can cause your power to crumble. But nevertheless, this wasn't really a life and death struggle between Tarentum and Rome, but the Romans treat it almost as if it is. And they persist, and eventually they defeat Pyrrhus. It, it helps that Pyrrhus doesn't have huge resources behind him. The Romans have more manpower. The Romans learn from their mistakes. Pyrrhus also has limited, perhaps less than full control of the Tarentine war effort, and perhaps also lacks has a limited attention span, because for a while he wanders off to Sicily in the middle of this conflict and comes um, fights the Carthaginians for a bit. But eventually the Romans win. By um, the uh, middle of the century, or the 260s, the Romans are confident enough, they're dominant enough in nearly all of Italy, south of the River Po, that they intervene in Sicily, in an area that has traditionally been very clearly marked down as the sphere of influence of Carthage, has the great Greek city of Syracuse, one of the greatest Greek cities in the world, in there in the, the southeast as one of its dominant powers, though one of several competing powers. And the Romans, almost on a whim, remarkably lightly, the Senate commits to sending an army to Sicily that leads very, very quickly to conflict with the Carthaginians. And we have the first Punic War that lasts for the best part of 20 years and involves appalling loss of life. And it's during this conflict that the Romans create a fleet from virtually nothing. Carthage is the great maritime power. The, the Carthaginians, the Romans refer to them as Poini, Phoenicians. That's where we get Punic from. And like so many conflicts in the ancient world, like so many peoples in the ancient world, they are referred to today not by the name they called themselves, but what by, by the name that others have called them. Um, in the same way that, you know, because of Thucydides and the way it's remembered, we talk about the Peloponnesian War. Now, obviously, the Spartans and the people who lived in the Peloponnese would have thought of it as more of an Athenian War, because that's their enemy. Um, we don't know so much what the Phoenicians called themselves. The Carthaginians do seem to have referred to themselves as Carthaginians. This was originally a foundation of the city of, of Tyre, but grew to be bigger than the, the parent city. And because Tyre is overrun by the Persians, by Alexander the Great, by the successors, and loses much of its independence, Carthage flourishes as this great mercantile and agrarian empire in the Western Mediterranean. And the Carthaginians, like the Phoenicians, they're great sailors, they're traveling around the coast of Africa, they're coming to Britain for tin and other things. They're developing colonies all along the North African coast in Spain, in Sicily. They are a maritime power with experience of the sea. However, although they are famous for this, and although they have a very large navy, it's a navy that rarely has to fight big naval battles because it doesn't have an opponent. 
And that may be one reason why the Romans are able to adapt so quickly. And there is the story that may well be true that they copy their warships from a Carthaginian vessel that runs aground on the Straits of Messina and the Romans take it to pieces and copy all the bits and then build a hundred of them and then after that they keep learning. And given that some of the um, Carthaginian wrecks that have been discovered probably dating to the end of this conflict do show signs of having been built to a fairly clear template with characters painted onto the timbers showing where to cut, where to assemble, this is almost like a huge model kit. So it's quite possible that that's actually what the Romans did. And given that the, the technology, many of the aspects of it, metalworking, particularly carpentry, are things with which they were familiar, then it's, it's an easier business than, say, it would have been to, I don't know, have a dreadnought run ashore in 1910 and for somebody to copy that and build it together, or today to build an aircraft carrier that functions in every respect with the aircraft that's required on it. So there is some real sense, and the Romans will always boast of their willingness and ability to copy the best ideas of other people. They are not at all embarrassed or ashamed about this. They take it as a point of pride. If somebody's got something better, well, we can copy that and we can make more of them. And they out-endure the Carthaginians during this conflict, which is focused overwhelmingly in Sicily. There are a few small-scale raids of the Italian coast by the Carthaginians. There's a much bigger Roman invasion of North Africa under Regulus that starts well, ends in disaster. Other than that, they fight at sea and they fight in Sicily itself. And there are relatively few pitched battles on land in, in this conflict. But the losses suffered at sea are very significant for the Carthaginians. The Romans win all but one of the major naval battles of the First Punic War, which is very striking given that they, as I say, lack this maritime tradition. But they find ways of using their strengths. You have early on the famous Corvus, the boarding bridge, that could be lowered onto the enemy deck and a spike would go through the timbers to pin it in place so your legionaries can swarm across and do what they're good at, fight toe-to-toe -to -toe and defeat the enemy. The Romans do, however, suffer appalling losses in storms. They, they really don't seem to know what they're doing, and Roman aristocrats and Roman commanders are pretty clueless when it comes to dealing with the weather. And succession of Roman fleets are lost in storms with immense loss of most of their crews. And ancient warships are very crew-heavy. For their size, they have an awful lot of people on them, particularly the rowers that are required to operate the main motive power and certainly the only power you use in battle. You don't have your sails up when you're fighting. You row um, so that you can ram. So the loss of life is huge, but the Romans stick to it. They're willing to build one more fleet by which, and near the end, the Carthaginians are not. They're, they're exhausted financially and also just they're fed up. They don't want to do it anymore. So the Romans win the fi final naval battle, the Carthaginians settle with them, peace is established, and it's a peace that is not so total as the victories the Romans have fought elsewhere. They, they do seem to treat this first overseas adventure as something different. So they don't absorb um, the Carthaginians, but they do, however, create a province in Sicily and a permanent presence there. And in the years that follow this um, peace treaty, they also see Sardinia and Corsica from the Carthaginians, or at least during this local rebellion there that the Romans intervene and essentially look at the Carthaginians and say, well, are you going to be able to stop us? And Carthage is not in a state um, to fight or willing to fight another war at this point. So there is a legacy, though, of bitterness on the Carthaginian side, and this will be expressed most clearly in the Second Punic War that begins in 218 BC and the career of Hannibal, son of one of the commanders, Hamilcar Barca, who had held out in Sicily to the end, claimed he'd never been defeated by the Romans, and according to Greco-Roman tradition, makes the infant Hannibal swear an oath never to be a friend to the Romans, all of this sort of thing. But there probably is an element where the Carthaginians have great reason to be upset. They don't understand the Romans treating them so badly because Carthage remains incredibly prosperous, very, very wealthy. It's still got territory elsewhere. It's still formidable. It was just weary at the end of the conflict. And in between the two wars, the Carthaginians, particularly under Hamilcar and his family, including Hannibal, develop the territory in Spain. They acquire some of the more lucrative areas of mineral resources. They um, 
build up a network of allies among the tribes. And it's from Spain that Hannibal will launch his great march to Italy, where he'll take his elephants over the, the Alps and um, arrive in Italy in the autumn of 218 BC. And that marches over land because the Carthaginians have lost all their bases in Sicily and on the other islands that allow them to get to Italy by sea, at least to get there easily. Ancient warships, because of these huge crews they have, all these rowers packed onto a ship, serving as ballast as much as anything else, apart from the main motive power, need a lot of food, they need a lot of water to um, function. And that reduces the range because there isn't space on these very slim warships to carry much in the way of stores. So Hannibal attacks Italy by land because he probably couldn't go any other way. The Romans had not expected that. We will, not in this series, because this isn't a major theme of the thing, but at some point I'll do more on the Punic Wars and the strategy of those conflicts, because that's an interesting topic in its own right. Hannibal will go to Italy. He will, in the first three campaigning seasons, inflict a succession of appalling defeats on the Romans. Uh, culminating in August 216 BC at the Battle of Cannae, where the best way to read the sources suggests that some 50,000 Roman and Allied soldiers die in that, on that day, within a few square miles around this battlefield. Now, in those first three years of campaigning, one third of Rome's Senate is killed. So out of 300 senators, you've lost slightly over 100, 80 of them at Cannae itself. So the losses are appalling and they strike all the way through Roman society, but perhaps particularly at the very top. So members of the Senate are meeting in an environment where there are spaces. Somebody used to sit next to you is now not there. All of you will have lost family members, close friends. Now the trauma of this is appalling. What is extraordinary is that the Romans don't give in. And famously the consul, the surviving consul who's blamed for the defeat at Cannae, because he refuses to negotiate with Hannibal afterwards, is hailed as a hero of the Republic and given a great welcome when he goes home. He's not trusted with an army after this anymore, but nevertheless, he's shown the right spirit. Romans do not give in. And it clearly flummoxes Hannibal. And that's, again, something I'll talk about when I talk about strategy in the Punic Wars. He expects the Romans to negotiate because anybody else would. Any other state at this point would have come to terms, would have accepted, okay, we've got to pay the Carthaginians some money, maybe we cede some territory, we've certainly lost a lot of prestige, but we're still here, the Republic still exists, we will continue. That just doesn't happen. And the rest of the war is a story of Hannibal trying to find other ways to put pressure on the Romans to make them give in, but it, it never gets quite as bad as that. And the Romans are willing to form armies, and this, because they've got the Roman citizen body is so huge, and this is something we'll look at in more detail when we come to look at imperialism expansion and the army in subsequent talks. They can absorb these casualties in a way that no other ancient state could have done, and they can still field armies and raise soldiers. They are lowering the age for military service. They are taking slaves, giving them their freedom, putting them into the legion. All sorts of emergency measures. You have some troops, particularly those former slaves, equipped with weapons taken from temples where they've been placed as spoils in past victories, dedicated to the offerings. The Romans are desperate. Their backs are to the wall, but they do have a lot of inherent strengths. There's perhaps a, a good parallel to Britain in 1940, after the fall of France and at the time of the Battle of Britain, in that looked at at the time, and even now you could see, well, it's, it's pretty desperate. Surely you'd expect the Germans to just keep rolling on. They've had so many victories up to this point. How are they going to be stopped? If you take a step back, you can see, well, the Royal Navy is, is far larger than the German Kriegsmarine. The RAF is actually, fighter command is well prepared for this. Production is well prepared. Training is there. Nevertheless, there's an element where it would have been so much easier at the time to give in. And a lot of people clearly expect you to do that on both sides because you're at that point. So the Romans have come through a crisis. And just because we can see there are inherent strengths in the Roman Republic that allow them to survive this doesn't mean it was inevitable. Doesn't mean that actually people at the time might not simply have blinked and thought, no, we can't take it. We're bound to be defeated. There's no point dying in a lost cause. Let's come to terms because I'm sure the enemy will be reasonable. <laughs> 
That doesn't happen. The Romans will send armies to Spain, to Macedonia, to Sicily. They'll defeat Carthage and its allies in all of those places. Spain's taken back. Sicily is taken back, having been lost. Eventually, they will send an army to North Africa, and that has successes there. And it's the Carthaginians who will recall Hannibal and his army from Italy, who's been there more than a decade, where the Romans can't stop him, though they can hem him in. He goes back to Africa, and at the Battle of Zama, he's defeated by Scipio Africanus. And finally, the Carthaginians come to terms. And the terms of the peace treaty, again, emphasize that Rome is dominant. The Carthaginians have to pay money to the Romans for 50 years as an indemnity for the, the crimes, the damage, damage devastation of the, the war. They lose their, their fleet, they lose their territories abroad. Um, permanently, that's recognized. It is a humiliation, but again, Carthage is still there. It's still a wealthy state. It's still got this highly organized agrarian system that produces a great surplus that is the, the starting point, really, of your trade system. It gives you something to sell in bulk to other people, something that people want, and you still have the merchant fleet to transport it. And Carthage will recover, and that's something that we'll look at in subsequent talks. So, let's just, that's before we get to our period, let's just do a quick overview of what will happen in the period I'm going to talk about today. Well, at least I'm going to talk about in this series of talks. I'm not going to do the whole thing in one go. Even I'm not quite that garrulous and crazy. So after the war with Hannibal, this really desperate struggle that devastates Roman Italy, devastates the Roman state and the population, but they come through. Within years, they are fighting wars against the Hellenistic kingdoms of the Eastern Mediterranean. If you look at the map, you can see who's out there. And... You've got wars against the Macedonians. You've got wars a little bit later, a war against the Seleucids. They will intervene in Galatia. They continue the presence in Spain. And maybe in part, it's because they don't want the Carthaginians to come back and they don't want anybody else to march from Spain into Italy. They push further north in Italy itself, pushing towards the Alps. And all of this happens in the first half of the second century BC. There is quite an intensive period of conquest of aggressive warfare in the aftermath of the Second Punic War, when you might have expected the Romans to want to lull, want to recover. In fact, they are quite aggressive and they have a very good military machine at this time because it's just learned lots of very hard lessons. And they will fight wars. They're also perhaps over defensive in the sense that you've just fought a war where it seems as if you were going to be destroyed, whereas if the Roman state, the Republic would have come to an end, which means you tend to see every threat in similar life or death terms even more than you do normally. So they will conquer by 146, they destroy Carthage, they sack Corinth, Macedonia has gone as a kingdom, it's now a Roman province. Uh, North Africa, there's a small Roman province there. They um, have conquered northern Italy, Cisalpine Gaul, Liguria, and Rome is very, very successful, but there have been problems. Some of those later wars don't go quite so well. And there are lots of stresses falling on society because all this conquest has brought immense amounts of wealth into the Republic but not in an equal way. Certain people and certain groups have benefited immensely. It's also brought in large numbers of slaves as a form of manpower that is, can be fully under the control of the owner, which gives advantages, but also disadvantages because it means you've got to feed them at every time and you can't just sack them and hope they'll come back and be hired again for next harvesting season or whatever it might be. But that distorts the picture. There is, are signs that Roman citizens who up until now have been always very willing to go into military service, to serve in the legions, go off, do their bit for the Republic, fight, go back home to their farm, that they are finding it more and more difficult to cope, that men are being ruined by being sent off to serve in a legion in Spain or Macedonia for 10 years while their farm falls to rack and ruin and they can't recover, they can't support their family when they, they get home, they've had to sell the property off. Because again, there's a lot more money around. People can afford to buy up land or they can afford to invest in and arrange for purchase of public land. So there are problems, there are strains. The system that has allowed Rome to be so successful, both political and military, 
is coming under a fair degree of pressure and it's not necessarily functioning quite as well as it had been. But on the whole, the Romans still seem to be doing quite well. But there are problems. In 133, you have the first of the Gracchus brothers to rise to prominence as a tribune, a political office in Rome, who is when he seeks re-election, wants to have a second term of office, something you're not supposed to have, has his head stoved in by a man, a senator, who's a cousin of his, and a mob of senators killed several of his supporters. Just over a decade later, his brother Gaius Gracchus will have a similarly spectacular career, and his suppression will end in much larger scale fighting. So for the first time in centuries, Roman politics becomes violent in a way that had been common in many city-states in the wider Mediterranean world, but the Romans had always managed to avoid, at least for most of their history. You have um, a series of crises. At the end of the second century BC, a succession of Roman armies are slaughtered by the migrating Cimbrian Teutones, probably Germanic, perhaps with some Celtic elements, but these warrior peoples that are on the move looking for land to settle in and sort of blunder around are treated rather arrogantly by the Romans fight and it doesn't go well for the Romans but the Romans aren't automatically winning battles there is something of a crisis there is a change there are during the first century BC you will see the rise of popular generals who start to monopolize some of the major commands and who are able to convince soldiers to be almost as loyal to them as they are to the state, or perhaps to see them as the true representative of the state rather than necessarily the Senate or other groups of senators who are influential at the time who are not treating them so well. And this will lead in 88 BC, for the first time ever, a Roman commander will lead his legions against the city of Rome when Sulla takes the city by force. His opponent, Marius, one of the other great heroes of the, the, the last generation, takes the city back a year later. His supporters are chased out and are defeated by Sulla when the city is stormed for a third time in less than a decade. When Sulla returns and makes himself dictator, has the prescription list where he kills his enemies, reforms the, the system to some extent, packs the Senate with his supporters and then retires. It's not the end. Civil war and internal um, political violence just keeps on going. We sometimes think of the, those decades of the first century BC as a very stable, peaceful time because the orator Cicero provides us with so much information for what's going on then. But in fact, when you look closely, you see that the threat of violence is always there and virtually none of the leading politicians of this era die a peaceful death and nearly all of them are killed by fellow Romans, not foreign enemies. So this will lead to the civil wars, the dictatorship of Julius Caesar, and ultimately the creation of the rule of emperors, the rule of one, the princeps, so the principate as we call it, by Caesar's great nephew Augustus, Caesar as he becomes, a man who claims to be Caesar's adopted son, although Caesar doesn't actually do that while he's alive. So you have the rule of the emperors, which is effectively a monarchy in the respect that it is the rule of one man, but it is never the rule of a king. The title of king is avoided, and for Augustus and his successors for a long time, the ceremony and the spectacle of royalty is also avoided. Augustus presents himself as primus inter pares, first among equals, as the leading magistrate of the state, but a servant of the state, not its master. He will walk through the streets of Rome. He will spend most of his reign actually traveling, visiting the provinces, receiving petitions, making decisions, doing all that sort of thing. He works very, very hard. And to everybody's surprise, this rather unhealthy youth survives to a ripe old age and outlives pretty much anybody who can remember the Republican system of government at all, let alone anyone who can remember it working properly. But of course, you also have, with the creation of the Principate, the emergence of emperors, the intrigue of the imperial court of succession. It's the I. Claudius stuff, and it's there in the Roman sources, the rumors of plots of murders, and in some cases, what turns into open attempts at, at coups. And you know, you have with Augustus, he exiles both his daughter and his granddaughter which is a pretty extraordinary thing to do. And in each case, is, case while there's a, a moral element and complaints about the behavior, there seems to be at least a degree of political element behind it as well. 
it takes a while for people to settle into this new system, but it is a time of another surge of expansion. The Romans push to complete the conquest of Spain. They consolidate the conquest of Gaul, um, west of the Atlantic, east to the Rhine that Caesar had um, done in the 50s BC. They push to the Danube. They confirm the arrangements in the eastern provinces in North Africa. There is a lot of aggressive warfare under Augustus. And regions that had been within the Roman influence but not necessarily occupied by the Romans in many cases get turned into provinces. And the whole system of imperial administration changes quite drastically in this time and becomes much more formal, much more organized and works on a different basis because with an emperor there's always somebody at the top, whereas in the Republic it power shifted so much. So it altered the relationship between the provincials and Roman authorities. And in the main, the impression is that actually life was better for the provincials when the provinces were run by imperial representatives than it had been by senatorial representatives, because the latter could get away with far more. Now, there are exceptions to that, but nevertheless, the standard of governorship seems to have improved, not necessarily out of altruism, um, though there are probably elements of that, but also because of the practical concerns of an emperor who does not want people mistreated so badly that they rebel. So you have the famous comment of the Emperor Tiberius that I want my governors to shear my sheep, not flay them, not skin them. So, you know, take the cream off the top, but don't drain the whole thing. We need to think about next year's revenue and next year's revenue. The, we want prosperous pro and settled provinces because that's more profitable for us. And it's also less trouble to us. We don't want to have the expense of garrisoning them with too many troops when we don't have to. So the relationship changes and you also have the development under the Julio-Claudian emperors of more and more people from the provinces, at least from their aristocracy, moving into the Roman imperial system and becoming Roman um, aristocrats, becoming eventually senators. And in time, there will be emperors who had been born and raised in provinces, some of them claiming descent from Roman settler families, but others not. And you will have emperors from Spain, from Gaul, from North Africa, from Syria and beyond. This is a system that develops where being Roman ends up with no ethnic connotation whatsoever. It's a legal status and access to becoming a senator, to becoming perhaps even emperor, is open to far more people. So there are major changes that go on there and it's, it's not a simple process. It's something that's well worth looking at, so we'll explore later on. You have good emperors, you have people like Augustus, you have others like who are seen as capricious and cruel, like Tiberius, increasingly so, and you have the mad and the bad, like Gaius Caligula, like Nero, and later, you know, familiar to us from the movie Gladiator Commodus. You will have these crazies who are um, addicted to entertainment, to chariot racing, to gladiators, to um, luxurious lifestyle, who will spend ridiculous amounts of money, drain the treasury, who will be capricious in their decisions, their appointments, who won't listen to sensible advisors, who mistreat the Senate, execute senators, all of this sort of thing. Dangerous people to be around. That didn't always mean that the rule of the provinces went badly because the emperor was at such a remove that sometimes as long as they had appointed fairly decent people, or fairly capable people perhaps, rather than decent in the, the moral sense, then the system still functions. But it does cause a strain. You will have, after a period of, yes, there have been a few attempted coups and, and murders within, but they're mostly around the imperial household under the Julio-Claudians, when Nero is finally forced out of power and commits suicide, or gets a slave to, to run him through, you have the year of four emperors, when after Nero, you get Galba, who lasts just a few months, who takes over by Otho, and then Vitilius, and finally Vespasian um, wins the civil war, becomes emperor, and is considered by the biographer Suetonius to be about the only person whose personality improved after becoming emperor. So he's remembered grudgingly, perhaps, because he wasn't always that likable and inherited a very uh, difficult situation, but as someone that people admire. But again, of the two sons who succeed him, the Emperor Domitian, his younger son, is not favorably remembered. 
largely because the biggest mistake any emperor could make is to kill off senators because it's the senators and their class and the people around them who write the history books. So if you do that, you're not going to be fondly remembered. Um, if you don't, even if you, you, know, if you perhaps allow scandals and corruption to go on amongst your senators, then you'll probably get quite a good press. There is then stability. You have, um, they avoid civil war when Domitian is murdered. But again, violent death was always quite a likely end for an emperor at any period. Um, it gets worse at some times. The second century AD is a little bit different. This is a time when, you know, famously Gibbon talked about the five good emperors and how, in a sense, blessed the, the population of the world was in this period. And compared to his own day, you know, he wasn't pushing it too far. This is the time of the greatest prosperity of the Roman Empire, and you can see it in the scale and luxury of the monuments. This is the time probably of the largest population of long distance trade flourishing and of these emperors who were more or less decent men. Hadrian was remembered much less fondly by the Romans than he has been by posterity, but even they sort of grudgingly admitted he was quite good at his job. They just didn't like the man. But you have Trajan, who is remembered with great fondness. Antoninus Pius, who is so secure that he doesn't even leave Italy. Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher emperor. You know, it, it's a... It's a very odd thing. You can read plenty of books of philosophy, but when you come to the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, you are actually reading the thoughts of the man who controlled most of the world and had to put into practice some of these concerns and these, these worries that he had. So, you know, that's a very different thing from the more abstract, the, the less, less significant musings of um, other philosophers at other times. Not that that necessarily means that his ideas are more profound than anyone else's, but it, it adds an interesting slant to it. But generally speaking, the empire was successful, it was prosperous, it was sophisticated, and it spreads. The last conquests really are done then. Britain is added by Claudius, completed under Vespasian. Um, and Titus and Domitian, his, his sons, though they, they, the attitude to the very north of what would become, uh, of northern Britain, what would become Scotland, varies and there are changes in policy. Dacia, modern day Romania, is added to the Roman Empire by Trajan. There are some territorial games in the east. <coughs> it's also the time when the Roman army becomes most visible archaeologically, and we can see lots about it, when it builds frontier systems like Hadrian's Wall there behind me, when it sets up lots of inscriptions and you have complex frontier zones, things we have to understand, and we need to look at whether these are bases for further expansion that in fact you never quite get around to doing, or meant as defensive. Orators in the second century, one, Aelius Aristides, will com compare the Roman army to um, the walls of a city. You know, it's a perimeter around the empire, protecting all that's worthwhile from what's outside. And in the main, there are not large numbers of troops within the Roman Empire. And overall, compared to its population and the sheer geographical scale, the Roman army is not that big, but it is largely professional and permanent and pretty efficient and sophisticated, at least in, in theory and ideally. You have, um, during this time, you can also look at stories of Again, what's happening in the provinces, the bits of Roman culture they decide to take, the people who buy into the Roman system and do very well from it, thank you very much. The others who appear almost immune to Roman presence, as if it's beneath them and will continue to live their lives as they've always done, whether through choice or necessity. And you have the active resistance. And we'll look at, um, in one talk, we'll look at Judea in particular and the, the big Jewish rebellion under Nero. Why that happens, why you have that pattern there, but why you get rebellions elsewhere, why you do and why you don't. And there is, perhaps it's slightly simplified, but there is a broad pattern that you will sometimes get a rebellion within a generation of first conquest, but after that, most provinces seem to be pretty settled. As I say, there are not large numbers of Roman troops dotted around as garrisons most of the Roman Empire, enough to control the population if they really didn't like the Romans. So the Romans are good at manipulating, at convincing at least the elites within these areas that it's best to stick with Rome. And of course, over time, people will forget what's come before and Rome becomes the only normality they know. You know it becomes, that's, that's how you expect, 
expect the world to be. It's, it's always worth remembering that we don't go quite to the end of it with these talks, but Roman Britain is one of the last provinces the Romans acquire, and they're here for more than three and a half centuries. So by the end of that time, very few people would have any real memory of what had come before. So the Romans are there for a long time and they're successful. We can also look at aspects of religion and we'll look a bit not only at Judaism, um, at the, the various cults within the Roman Empire, the mystery cults. We'll look at the early church, the um, treatment of Christians, the persecutions, that sort of thing. And within the broader context of all this, of how this world develops, one thing is very noticeable is that conquest slows dramatically after Augustus and then pretty much stops. And we need to wonder why this happens. Why does this aggressive expansionist empire turn into this consolidating, this static empire? And you can also say as well, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? You know, is that a, a, a reason for its ultimate decline? Spoiler alert, but I think not. Um, but people have considered that. You know, was this a system that required constant expansion and once you don't have it, then um, you cause all sorts of problems. Um, however, again, we're stopping in 200 and the Roman Empire is gonna be around in the West until the, the later fifth century and in the East for another thousand years after that. So it's a lot more complicated than that. And maybe sometime in the future, we'll do some things on the decline of the Roman Empire and, and, and all that sort of thing. But that's the overview. That's the scope of these talks. That's what I'm gonna try and cover in The Conquered and the Proud. But let's just, at the very end of this talk, before we move on to looking at the Roman political system and the Republican system in the next one, we'll just look at our starting point. And quite simply, what is the world like in 200 BC? Who is there? Who are the key players? So it's worth looking at the map to get a sense of this. You've got Rome itself. Um, again, we've looked at its, its history up till this point. We won't do more on that now. It's a mixture of the Romans themselves in Rome, but also colonies of Roman citizens that have been dotted around Italy at various times, or in some cases are communities that have been turned into colonies. These have full legal Roman status, and the citizens there are Romans in every respect. They even, they are part of the Roman political system. However, you have to go to Rome physically to be able to vote or to stand for office and that sort of thing. You can't do it at a distance, you can't mail it in. You also have Latin communities that have Latin rights that, as I say, are not quite as full as Roman citizenship, but nevertheless are pretty good. They are a sort of on the a, a stage towards it. And while there is a recognized pathway of moving from Latin citizenship to Roman citizenship, there are cases, and we had this during the, the Second Punic War, where Latin communities actually prefer to stay Latin and prefer to keep their own identity rather than becoming part of the greater uh, Roman citizen body thing. And there are allied communities with other statuses that are and other relationships with Rome that might in time become Latin, might in time become Roman. Population, well, we'll come back to that in more detail. There's a, a good estimate from Polybius of the military manpower of Rome and its allies before, just before the, the war with Hannibal, that estimates this as over 700,000. Um, now that's about half Roman, slightly less than half, more of it Latin and allied. That's adult males, but that's all adult males. Um, so you are dealing with a state, a city-state that is far bigger than any other city-state that has come before, and particularly larger in its citizen body. If you looked at classical Athens in its heyday, maybe Athens, you know, you're including a large part of Attica, you're including these communities outside the city itself, you could say the population overall was 250,000, maybe 300,000, so those are the sort of rule of thumb estimates we have. However, only a minority were Athenian citizens. And, you know, you're talking sort of 40, 50,000 male citizens. You've got women who can't vote, can't serve in politics, can't fight. You've got foreigners, you've got the metics, you've got lots of slaves. So Rome is far bigger than that. But what's really significant is that the number of citizens is far greater than anything has come before. So it's, it's, it's sheer size and scale, but not simply everybody, it's the citizens too. 
By this time, you've got the Roman colonies dotted around Italy. There aren't any really abroad at this point, but you have as pretty much permanent provinces. You've got Sicily, you've got two provinces in Spain, you've got Corsica and Sardinia. <clears throat> and to each of these, you send a governor every year, and in most cases, troops as well. And you're often involved in fighting there. But you also will come onto this in more detail when we look at how the system works. Province can still mean very much a sphere of responsibility for someone. So it's more than simply um, a fixed geographical territorial area as we would tend to think of it. It can be, for instance, the, the war against this tribe or the war against this kingdom. <clears throat> Now, that's Rome, and it's successful, it's dominating most of Italy, it's got these overseas provinces, it's big, it's different, it's riding high having defeated Hannibal. Carthage, by contrast, has now been reduced to Africa, and the Romans have encouraged and favoured the uh, Numidian kingdom, um, the neighbour of Carthage, largely because... Massinissa and the Numidian king switched sides at the right time and fought for the Romans in Zama. But also they use it as a sort of check on the Carthaginians. And the Numidians, their aristocracy has this sort of love-hate relationship with the Carthaginians that would be quite familiar to many um, countries of um, the former European empires in the, the 20th century and beyond, where culturally there's quite a bit of the former imperial master system they quite like. So linguistically, in terms of luxuries, this sort of thing, ways of doing things, but that doesn't mean they actually like the political state that it represents. So there isn't necessarily a rejection of all things Carthaginian, but nevertheless, they see themselves as rivals. They see Carthage as a likely enemy, and the Romans are quite happy to encourage them to do this. And whenever there's, the Romans are brought in to arbitrate on disputes between the Numidians and the Carthaginians, they just about always favor the Numidians. So they do make it clear to the Carthaginians that they are inferior. As far as the Romans are concerned, they are not Rome's equal, in spite of the fact they're still have a big population, have lots of money, have control a large part of the North African coast, if, if nothing else overseas, they are not Rome's equal. They are subordinate. They are someone who has to do what the Romans say. Probably the Romans aren't going to say very much, don't actively want you to do that much, but nevertheless, you do not have rights of your own. You get what we decide to give you. And this is a Roman attitude to all its allies but it's still struggling, whereas it's been quite good so far at absorbing communities in Italy into this system and rewarding them enough through being Rome's ally to make them put up with the fact that they are subordinate. It's struggling to do this overseas and particularly in relation to somewhere like Carthage. Now, we will again look at this in more detail in the future, but Carthage will recover its economy remarkably quickly. And one of the key people involved in this is Hannibal himself, who, having fought tooth and nail against the Romans, nevertheless remains such a strong patriot that he does set his soldiers to restoring irrigation systems, restoring the farms and the estates, and manages Carthage as its senior magistrate very well for a while to set them on the path to recovery. However, the Romans are very nervous of him and there are plenty of Carthaginian rivals who don't like him. He is forced out and forced into exile. Again, story we'll come on to later. Let's go to the Eastern Mediterranean and the Hellenistic world, the, the Greek world. You've got three major kingdoms that have broken away from the empire that Alexander the Great had created, but then was unable to bequeath to anybody when he died. So you have the Antigonid dynasty ruling in Macedonia itself, and they at this stage don't control much more territory than Macedonia, and they have problems with Thracians and Illyrians and others on their borders to the north. They do intervene to varying degrees depending on the strength of the king into southern Greece amongst the city-states. And there you have a patchwork of all those famous city-states like Athens and Corinth and Sparta and all this sort of thing, though much reduced from their heyday, but also leagues of cities. Groups like the, um, uh, the sorry, the, the Achaean and the Aetolian leagues where 
Cities have surrendered a degree of their independence to act together to make themselves strong enough to compete against kingdoms like Macedonia. But also you still have people like the Ptolemies, the dynasty that's established itself with its heartland in Egypt but has Cyprus and an interest in many of the, the Greek islands and tries to present itself as a the sort of true successor to Alexander and the Macedonians. So is involving itself in Greek affairs, in Greek diplomacy as well. Now... The, um, <clears throat> the Ptolemies have, at this stage, still a huge fleet. And they are a naval power, probably the strongest. They do a lot to secure the, the waterways, the, the trade of um, the Eastern Mediterranean, partly because they benefit so much from it. You know, Egypt produces a great surplus of wheat and other crops. It's got luxury goods coming in from elsewhere that go through Alexandria, the great trading port on the north, into the wider Mediterranean world. So it's in their interest. They um, have um, rivals though, because you have the Seleucids to the east uh, with the heartland in Syria. They will in time come under pressure from indigenous and external groups further to the east, but they're, they're still stretching at this point into the, the borders of what's now Afghanistan. And at the time, in 200, they've got Antiochus III, Antiochus the Great, one of their more successful kings. And they go from there right up to the Mediterranean coast. They have a very large army. They have a large fleet. But they're spread thinly because they've got lots of problems. You have smaller Hellenic kingdoms in Asia Minor. You've got Pergamon, for example. And they have emerged. They've managed to establish themselves, carve out their own little niche um, in that area by playing off the rivalries of the big three, but also by fighting their own way. So you've got this mixture. Now, the Hellenic kingdoms are the, the heirs to Alexander in the military sense, as well as the political sense. And they have armies like the armies of Pyrrhus that are based around the Macedonian model. They also have fleets with uh, you know, Greek-style warships and that sort of thing, some of which they've developed further in the Ptolemies in particular, like building really big ships. But the armies remain based around a core of heavy infantry in the Pike Phalanx. They also have cavalry, some of them heavy cavalry, some of them the Seleucids in particular experiment with cataphracts, with armoured men, armoured horses. They never quite seem to have as high a proportion of horsemen in any field army as Alexander had managed. But that probably means that Alexander is the exception rather than that they are unusual. And that combination of cavalry and infantry that Philip and Alexander use, use so well doesn't always work quite so flexibly and fluidly um, with the successors. They'll also add exotica like war elephants and things like this. And the Seleucids have the advantage because they have access to elephants from India that are larger than the breeds from North Africa that are trainable at this time. Um, so although we paradoxically we think of African elephants as bigger, the ones that are being used for war are not typically bigger than Indian at this time. Now these soldiers are a mixture of true professionals, some of them mercenaries, some of them regulars, but also people who are obliged um, as part of the, the way they get property and land to fight when called upon. So sort of semi-professional, semi-regular, um, that fight in a certain way, they do generally have pretty good standards of training. And at least in any army, there will be a nucleus of professional, skilled, well-drilled soldiers, backed by others that are semi-professional and can quickly pick it up, as well as then all the levies and allies and people you've got. Now, many of these are very good, but they are a, a limited, finite quantity, in that if they suffer heavy losses, they're quite hard to replace quickly, because either you've got to find new professional soldiers, or the semi-professionals are from these distinct communities with certain rights, certain obligations, and again, they're limited in numbers, so if they go, you can't get them back quickly. So that's what's happening in the Eastern Mediterranean world. And finally, let's look at other areas where the Romans have contact. So Northern Italy, because they still haven't conquered Cisalpine Gaul fully yet, and Liguria, and the communities in Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, and um, elsewhere in the Balkans. They have some contact across the, the Adriatic coast. These are not areas with big kingdoms, with organized, centralized, large states. 
Now, many of the communities in certain areas, particularly in Iberia, are sophisticated, well-organized, uh, probably city-states run by magistrates, by law, by, you know, with lots of skilled craftsmen, all this sort of thing, but they haven't really united into big kingdoms. And that may be a reflection of the disruption caused by Carthaginian presence, then Roman presence, then conflict between the two. So they are quite sophisticated communities, civilized communities, but they're not united to make them as militarily powerful as, say, the Seleucids. They are a different sort of problem. It's a different problem to scale. Many of the peoples, the majority, are both in, in as you get further north and west in Spain, but also it's certainly in the, the Gallic areas like the Gauls of uh, Cisalpine um, Gaul, northern Italy, um, they're loosely organized by tribes, by clans, under different kings, different chieftains. We tend to see these systems only from the outside, what the Greeks and Romans choose to tell us about them. So uh, we have to be a little bit careful because they may well have got things wrong more often than not. Nevertheless, it's, um, it's broadly true. You know, these are not, these are areas where dealing with one tribe and one leader and defeating him or making peace with him doesn't necessarily mean that his neighbor is going to follow suit. In fact, making peace with one might be a way of making an enemy of another and vice versa. The Romans will nearly always find local allies wherever they go in these areas because there are groups that hate the neighbor they've known for generations far more than the incoming imperialist. These tend to be more loosely organized. They tend to be more rural in terms of the settlement pattern. But again, that's, that's not always true. And there are developing cities and towns in parts of Gaul, particularly the south, um, and certainly, as, as I mentioned, in, in southern and central Spain um, and elsewhere. So it's, it's a mixed pattern. Generally speaking, these are characterized as barbaric, as warlike, as raiders, as a threat by the Greco-Roman sources. The archaeology would suggest that there are, that warfare is quite common in many of these societies and between many of these communities, just from the prominence of weapons, of fortifications, this sort of thing. So broadly speaking, it's probably right. And that's partly because the ancient world is just a dangerous place. And if you have a neighbor who is a threat to you, then the odds are you will arm yourself for protection. Um, so these things ha can easily create a cycle. And of course, there will be and already has been an impact from the, the rise of Rome to being this bigger state and a bigger population and a bigger market and how that will distort um, events well beyond their frontiers as people realize that I can get good money through selling slaves into the Roman uh, Republic into their sphere of influence so maybe I should go and raid my neighbors because then I can go and buy wine and other luxuries and things like that and get from the Mediterranean so it's always a case where as states expand as empires are created there's a sort of ripple knock-on effect where they can disrupt the systems of um, other communities well beyond their borders to make things less stable that doesn't mean we can blame everything on the nasty old imperialists and that they cause everything, because very clearly the evidence suggests that Iron Age, Europe, North Africa, most of, of Asia in this area, is pretty warlike. That most of the communities and societies fight each other, whether for protection, whether aggressively. Um, and as I say, those, those two tend, one tends to lead to the other over time. So this is not a peaceful world of everybody living in tune with nature before the nasty Romans come along and conquer it. But nor is it a terrible, barbaric, savage world with no rule of law that the Romans have to come in and administrate an order. You know, the truth is a far more complicated mix of everything and lots of different gradations all the way through. And that's going to be the story that we'll tell in future talks.